at our start time. Bring up my chat. And Discord. Cool. Well, I think we're ready to go. So, welcome back to CIS 75. Moving on into our second week. We are only going to focus on one chapter and that is on malware. Malware has changed throughout the years. It used to be that it was very easy to put malware in certain groups because malware would only do one thing. That's not true for the last couple years where malware does a number of things, but it's all packaged in one. So industry doesn't really label malware by their by their individual groups because malware can fall into various groups depending on what they do. So the terms that we're going to cover really are more of the different functions more so than specific malware. This is very similar to a car. What is a car supposed to do? Right, take us from A to B. But yet it can do so much more than just that. It can keep us cool in the heat. It can keep us warm when it's cold outside. It has a radio. It has internet, it has GPS. It has a computer that manages all its internal functions. It, a car, now a modern car, right, shelter. A modern car does way more than the originally intended creation of the car. You know, it's taken things from other places, other conveniences from like our home and applied them into the car. In the same way, malware used to be a specific thing that did one thing, but now malware has, be has taken code and, and functions from other pieces of malware that it's, it's malware is just the term to use, but the functions can be described individually. So the first one is ransomware. This is malware or malicious software that takes over a computer and as the name implies, demands a ransom. It can encrypt the files on a machine and hold them hostage. Ransomware can also threaten by posting messages that say, hey, we're going to report you to law enforcement to, because you're using pirated software or uh, it downloads uh, files that, that can trigger child pornography uh, alerts. Ransomware can connect to that system and expose sensitive information or pictures from the victim's computer. One of the best practices against ransomware is having an effective backup system, storing files in separate locations that won't be impacted should the computer fall victim to ransomware. It's not at all foolproof, but it is a way. Trojan horses. A type of malicious software that is disguised 
as legitimate software. They rely on unsuspecting individuals to run them, providing attackers with a path into that, that device. A remote access trojan, otherwise known as a rat, provides attackers with remote access to systems. Some of them are legitimate, like LogMeIn, TeamViewer, uh, making identifying tools on the network much more difficult. Trojans can be combated by security awareness trainings and anti-malware tools. But again, it's totally possible for a unsuspecting user to download a Trojan and it have ransomware capability. A worm is a piece of malware that spreads through automated means. So it by itself scans the network to see what other machine on the network can also fall vulnerable uh, or has a vulnerability that it can expose. It can also continue to spread through email attachments, network file shares, or other methods. The thing about a worm is that it self-installs. A rootkit is a piece of malware that attacks a system, but the place where it, it attacks is what makes this stand out. A rootkit will install itself in places like the master boot record or on the firmware of a microchip. That way it works at a much lower level where anti-malware tools aren't able to detect them. A system that is infected with a rootkit cannot be trusted. The most common recommendation whenever a rootkit has taken hold is to rebuild the system because you may not know where that, that piece of malware is now hiding. It could be hiding in the BIOS chip. It could be hiding on another memory chip. Who knows? It could be hiding in the firmware of a hard drive. It's totally possible for code to write itself in locations that are, that are harder to detect, harder to uh, read and, and verify that they haven't been unaltered without using other specialized tools. A bot is a remotely controlled device that has been infected in this sense, because like a Discord bot is not the same. But nonetheless, <coughs> we're talking about a remotely controlled uh, infected system. A group of them is called a botnet, which can't be used together to launch attacks against victims and those would be a denial of service attack. Many botnets use command and control systems to operate in a client server mode. The bots will contact their central control system. That central control system will give them updates and instructions. And that could be through protocols like the IRC. It even could be in HTTPS. IRC is easier to detect because it stands out. HTTPS is much harder to figure out because number one, it's encrypted, and number two, it's very common. And so of course, malware writers are going to use things that are common and easy to evade, like writing their, their uh, command and control software to use HTTPS. 
Botnets rely on a combination of their size and number of systems that are in them to overwhelm applications and systems and make it impossible to identify legitimate traffic. Identifying a botnet driven uh, denial of service attack requires monitoring network traffic, trends, and upstream visibility from an internet service provider. Security Information and Event Management Systems, or SIEM systems, can correlate data from multiple sources for behavioral analysis to identify traffic from, from regular uh, traffic. A way of thinking about botnets, uh, I used to do this when I would do career days at uh, elementary schools, is I would ask for a couple volunteers to stand up in front of the class with me. And I would have the rest of the class tell however number of kids that are in the front three sentences. And it was the job of the kids who are standing up in the front to be able to remember as many sentences as they could and tell them back to the class. Well, this always creates chaos because every kid wants to be the kid that, that is remembered. So it just becomes in a chaotic shouting match as all the kids are trying to say their three sentences to their friend and the, the kids in the front just get overwhelmed like a real DDoS attack. And when the noise finally subsides, I ask them what did they hear and most of them say either nothing or they recall what the very last person said. Which is pretty much exactly how it happens in a real DDoS attack. A keylogger. Keyloggers capture keystrokes from a keyboard, mouse movement, touch screen inputs, or credit card swipes. They work by capturing data, either in the kernel, API, scripts, or directly from memory. Regardless how they do it, whether physical, or digital, keyloggers will capture input to be analyzed and used by an attacker. Uh, for about, I think it was 60 bucks, you can get a keylogger at DEF CON. And it's this tiny little thing, like this picture that you can attach to a keyboard, insert it to a computer. The, the computer itself won't recognize a new device attached, it actually sees it as the keyboard because what the keylogger does, it, it passes the keyboard through and just records all the input. So the computer doesn't know that there's a new device attached. And how often are you looking at the back of your computer to see if somebody has put a, a keylogger behind? Not often. Most people forget to look at the back of their of their computer to see if anything has changed. And that's true at work as well, where these things can be used. A logic bomb functions is a function within code that's placed inside other programs that will activate when certain conditions are met. They are a consideration in software development and systems management. You know, they could have a significant impact if they successfully activate. Like, let's say, a disgruntled employee who has access to the code, to the source code of whatever product they're creating. They could insert a function that at a certain time, date, or whenever something happens, everything, all data gets destroyed, things turn off, mayhem occurs. Viruses are malicious programs that self-copy and self-replicate. They require one or more infection mechanisms that they use to spread themselves paired with a search capability to find new places to spread. Viruses have a trigger. This sets the condition when the virus will execute and a payload, which is what the virus actually does, delivers, or the actions it performs. There are a couple of these, like memory resident, where they only live in memory while the device is running. 
There's the non-memory, which will execute, spread, and shut down. There's those that install themselves into the boot sector of a drive or storage media. There are the macros who run within the word processing software and email. There are also fileless viruses that spread through spam email or malicious websites, exploding flaws in browser plugins or the browsers themselves. They inject themselves into memory and conduct further activity, including abilities to reinfect after a reboot. These suckers do not need local file storage. Uh, their trace would be a persistent technique. The way to find them would be find, looking at, for example, a registry change. Spyware simply obtains information about an individual organization or system. They track browser habits, installed software, and report back. They can access things like the web camera, the microphone. Uh, they are typically associated with identity theft and fraud, advertising, redirection of traffic, digital rights management, monitoring, and stalkerware. Potentially unwanted programs are typically installed without the user's awareness or as part of a bundle with another installation. In this group, we have things like adware, browser toolbars as shown, web tracking or web browser tracking programs, and so on. For the most part, they're removable by anti-malware. Malicious code are scripts and custom built code that can be used by malicious actors. These attacks happen locally or remotely, leveraging things like uh, PowerShell, Bash, or Python on local systems. Living off the land is a term you should be familiar with. It's uh, using pre-existing tools or built-in tools like PowerShell, Bash, and Python uh, to launch attacks. It becomes a little more difficult for us to detect and stop because they're using things that we have deemed legitimate use, like installing Python. It's a little harder to determine that this Python program is doing something it shouldn't do when Python is installed in the first place, like on Macs. And we can't forget adversarial artificial intelligence. It is a developing field where AI is used by attackers for malicious purposes. It is becoming increasingly common to see AI and machine learning as part of security tool sets. As new technology arrives, it will provide attackers with new attack surfaces. So just because AI is something new doesn't mean that it won't be used for both defense and offense. Any questions on these features? Elliot says no. I 
I see a reaction of uh, we're good. Okay. I want to take your attention into the work this week. You're going to need some uh, hiking shoes because it's a walk. What you will be doing in GCP is setting up a specific machine where you will run a virtual machine within that. So we're doing nested virtualization. And the reason why we're doing that is to put the specific machine that we're going to use as far away from us as possible because we are going to purposefully infect it and then disinfect it. We are going to purposefully install malware into a virtual machine and then we're going to work to disinfect it. So to do that we're going to make a virtual machine and put it away from us. Put some hazmat suits on and everything. So I, I updated it thanks to uh, Karen who pointed out that some steps weren't working anymore thanks GCP but essentially you will make a specific type of machine with a specific type of processor you'll get the first part off of my github then you're going to make some changes to that specific virtual machine that you created that Linux VM once all that is done then uh, you will make you will either make or use a Windows VM that you already have that as long as it's in the same region and zone will be able to connect to it uh, via RDP and this step this last step is the one that you'll be doing a couple times because again you are going to purposefully infect a Windows XP system you're going to run tools to disinfect it and then at that point that VM is pretty much dead so you'll just delete it import a new one following these steps and start again yes uh, you are going into the danger zone there are a number of pieces of malware that you will need to run and you want to run them one at a time they are all base64 encoded so I've provided you a tool that you need to use in order to decode it so that it's that it's able to run that's what this is for you'll extract the zip files that are sitting on the desktop uh, this is a example this is something this is, this works if you put, let's say, malware one, which is WannaCry, you put it in the same folder where b64.exe lives. That's the only way this command will work. But again, this is an example of the command to decode a source file to a destination file. So in this case, b64.exe will decode a file called malware one and turn it into m1.exe once that happens and you see something similar to this where there's no errors then you double click that new file that was created and it will infect the system again the first piece of malware that you're gonna fight against is the legendary WannaCry when that happens and it's finally a fully uh, hit fully fully hit by the malware you're going to need to use wanna kiwi in order to disinfect the system from wanna cry now i want to let you know that it it is wanna cry it is the real legitimate wanna cry the one that hit the world and shut down tons of systems in 2017 
You are really infecting a system. So this malware will work as intended. It's not going to be easy to disinfect. Wana Kiwi has a good like 80% chance of succeeding in finding the, the key in memory and decrypting the contents. It is totally possible that you go through all these steps, you correctly infect the system, you run Wana Kiwi correctly, and it is unable to find the key. That is real. Because it's real malware. It doesn't want to just give up its key and in reverse, you're, you're, it's going to be a fight. You may be successful on your first try. Not everybody is. If that happens to you where you are unsuccessful, just shrug, delete, go back to step four, import a new copy, and try again. Once you do that, and you get through that first uh, piece of malware, write down the experience. Write down uh, what you learned. Uh, how tough was it, or was it a piece of cake? And then repeat for all the other pieces of malware. You should not need a larger hard drive because the Windows XP VM is not that big at all. It's pretty small. You can if you want, but I don't think you need any more than like 40 gigabytes. It's, it's a really small virtual machine. You will be doing that for both the in-class assignment and the lab. The difference is the lab is using this specific zip file, mod2lab. So if I'm not mistaken, you have a total of nine pieces of malware. So you are to infect nine different virtual machines. I would not do them at the same time because they're all going to function differently. Do them one at a time. Use whatever tools you wish to use to fight against the pieces of malware that I, that I have waiting for you. This is an exercise in fighting malware, which you will be doing in real life. The difference is we're purposefully infecting a system and then we're going to disinfect it. Any questions, anything not make sense, looking at the steps, Uh, yes, I highly suggest using GCP. That way, all the malware is up in the cloud in a safe place away from your machine, from the machine you are on. That way, there is just no chance you can self-infect yourself. All the files for the lab activity should be in the desktop of the Windows VM. If for whatever reason they're not there, uh, the GitHub link 
has them. You can always go on my GitHub to my CIS75 repository and you will see the zip files there. So I, I definitely want to stress that you want to use Google Cloud. You want to follow these steps. I understand that it's a hike. I understand that it's going to be a journey to set this up, but it's good for you to get practice in using the cloud. And it's also good for the safety of your system and all systems that are in your network. You don't want to run this stuff locally. It's best to put it in the cloud in a nested VM away from you. Because all these things are real. All of these uh, pieces of malware that I put together for you, this little collection, have all been captured from the wild. None have been neutered. Uh, graphical evidence is just a, a fancy way of saying screenshot. And as I said last week, you don't have to write an essay on what you saw. This is not English class. Uh, what do you want in the screenshot? Well, for example, you could take a screenshot of when you successfully infected it. So like uh, the screenshot that I have in the guide, for example. It takes a while to pull up. Hey, look, I successfully infected my system. A screenshot of that, a screenshot of you successfully uh, uh, decrypting or disinfecting the system. You want to show you did it. You were successful in doing it. The any.run is a site where you can upload malware and see what it does. It's just another point of view. So you give them a piece, you create an account, you give them a piece of malware, you can see all the processes it tried to run, all the, um, the behavior graphs. It, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool tool for you to, to get acquainted with. The things that you learn from this combined with you actually running it on the Windows VM together will give you plenty of stuff to talk about. Because again, all the assignments are, are what did you learn? So you could totally combine what you learned from this plus what you did yourself in Windows together to write your your submission. Does that make sense? Cool. Other questions? All right, well, seeing no questions, have fun infecting Windows XP over and over and over again. You are always welcome to work together. Make use of the chat, make use of the Discord voice channels. 
to work together. This is going to be a fun and interactive lab. It may get frustrating. Like I said, the first one that you're going to deal with is want to cry and it is it it can make you want to cry. But that's okay. You'll you'll figure out how to beat it. <laughs>